Thank you very much. I'd like to extend my very best wishes to Gobind Karana on this occasion. Uh, I'm very glad to be here to uh, participate in this uh, symposium uh, with you. This, this picture, which um, you've seen before, Good, thank you. This picture which you've seen before was uh, taken uh, in Stockholm in 1968. It's Gobind Karana, uh, Bob Holly, and myself. Um, and um, um, it, it's um, since, since, since both Gobind Karana and I deciphered the genetic code, I thought it would be um, more appropriate to talk about deciphering the genetic code than my current work in, in neurobiology. So deciphering the, the code was the first project I worked on as an independent investigator. Uh, I thought that if I was gonna work this hard, I might just as well have fun. And by fun, I mean I wanted to explore a really exciting project, a really interesting project, and I wanted to to uh, hopefully explore and uh, discover um, uh, things. Now, in 1958, uh, one of the most important problems in bi biochemistry was how to, to understand how proteins are synthesized. And there were some of the best biochemists in the world were working on this problem. But uh, I became very interested in it and I decided to switch fields. Uh, which is, uh, as we all know, a very dangerous thing to do when you're first, when you're starting your first uh, um, uh, independent uh, position. But uh, I, I made, I decided to make cell-free uh, bacterial extracts to try to get the synthesis of protein. And the first question I asked was, does messenger RNA exist? In 1958, transfer RNA had been found, but messenger RNA had not, was not known. Uh, and so I prepared DNA and ribosomal RNA, thinking that uh, if messenger RNA existed, some messenger RNA would have to be on ribosomes because it was known that amino acids were incorporated into protein on ribosomes. Now, um, I worked for about a year and a half by myself and improving the system and um, improving it in various, in various ways. And uh, all of the results suggested that um, uh, RNA stimulated protein synthesis, but not DNA, which was very exciting to me because this was the first in vitro demonstration of messenger RNA that, that I was aware of. Uh, then Heinrich Matai joined me as a postdoctoral fellow. He came to the NIH. He wanted to do cell-free protein synthesis. He thought there'd be many people working on cell-free protein synthesis at the NIH. I was the only one. So they sent him to me. And I accepted him with open arms. Uh, then um, I rounded up uh, various kinds of RNA to test the specificity of the RNA in stimulating amino acid incorporation into protein. And we found that, that uh, yeast ribosomal RNA was active, that tobacco mosaic virus RNA was 50-fold more active than our ribosomal RNA preparations. And I, at the time, I erroneously thought that uh, the tobacco mosaic virus RNA might be making the coat protein of the, the virus. I also found, uh, obtained some poly-U. I called Fra Heinz Frankel Conrad in, who, at Berkeley, who was the world's expert on TMV RNA, and he had um, a mutant virus that had an amino acid replacement in the coat protein, and he invited me to come to his laboratory to synthesize radioactive protein starting uh, directed by wild-type TMV RNA and the mutant tobacco mosaic virus RNA, and he and a colleague in his laboratory would then determine the amino acid sequence of the synthesized proteins. So I uh, gave the poly U to Heinrich Matai, and 
I thought that if this, if poly U was active as messenger RNA, it would direct the synthesis of a protein containing only one kind of amino acid. And I asked Heinrich to make 20 different solutions, each containing 19 cold amino acids and a different radioactive amino acid. I also thought if, it, if the poly U were active, it could be used with other polynucleotides to decipher the genetic code. Well, I flew off to Berkeley and I worked in Franklin Conrad's lab, which was a terrific lab, by the by, uh, for a month. And then Heinrich called me very excitedly and said that the poly U directs the synthesis of, um, uh, of polyphenylalanine, only incorporation of phenylalanine into protein. And uh, this was really, was really exciting. <clears throat> we immediately characterized the, the product of the reaction and uh, also showed that, that phenylalanine tRNA was an intermediate in the synthesis of polyphenylalanine, which was the first real proof that transfer RNA is an intermediate in protein synthesis. We also showed that Single-stranded poly U was active as a template, but not double or triple-stranded poly U poly A helices, which was the first uh, RNA antisense uh, uh, experiment. We started to synthesize many different kinds of polynucleotides, and on this slide is shown the minimum species of bases required for mRNA uh, uh, codons. Uh, we showed that the, that the code was a triplet code, and, um, and we could determine whether a codon contained, for example, one C and two A's, or, or two C's and, and one A, uh, by varying the concentration of, of um, the, the, the bases in the polynucleotides. Uh, Severo Ochoa immediately uh, joined uh, in on this uh, search for the base compositions of codons, and uh, it was a very, uh, ex for three years, uh, it was an extremely competitive uh, uh, kind of, uh, of thing. I had never met Ochoa. Uh, one time I was in New York, I gave him a ring, and he invited me to come to his lab. I told him I wanted to speak to him, and he invited me to come to his lab, <clears throat> and I thought it would be much more civilized to collaborate, divide the problem, or in some way cooperate with, uh, with him, but it was impossible to do that. And, uh, and so it was a highly competitive uh, uh, three years. But then I found out that, uh, that I really like to compete. And it's not the winning, <laughs> it's not the winning or the losing that I thought about, but it just made me more efficient to get things done and having deadlines all the time. So I like competition. I think it's a useful, a very useful thing. Um, but we, in this way, we determined the base composition of codons, but not the base sequences. And then I wondered if a triplet could be recognized on a ribosome by an appropriate species of transfer RNA. And the very first experiment worked. Actually, Leon Heppel gave me the oligonucleotides to do this, to do this experiment. And, uh, and so a doublet was inactive, a triplet um, uh, directed the appropriate species, lysed tRNA on ribosomes, and um, a hexanucleotide increased the amount uh, uh, bound. To, uh, to ribosomes. So this provided a very simple uh, assay to determine nucleotide sequences of codons. Now, the only problem was that almost, that very few of the uh, triplets had ever been isolated or synthesized. Most of them were new compounds. Um, Gobin Karana and his colleagues did heroic, uh, w monumental work in devising the methods for the synthesis of triplets. They synthesized the 64 triplets. They also synthesized repeating poly, uh, uh, polynucleotides with repeating doublets, triplets, and tetramers, which they used then to direct cell-free protein synthesis. And so, and whereas uh, we used two enzymatic 
methods for the synthesis of triplets. Phil Leader had, seen, had shortly before this had seen uh, an advertisement in a journal where a, a, um, uh, uh, a chemist in Europe wanted to sell half a gram of each of the 16 possible doublets. And uh, we bought all 16 uh, doublets to use as primers for, for triplet synthesis. When, when the package arrived, there were only 15 vials, not 16. And when I checked, I found that the US Customs agent had taken one entire vial to test the drugs. So, <laughs> but we used the rest. Uh, Phil Leader and Richard Brimacoman in our lab uh, went to Maxine Singer's lab. Maxine was an expert with polynucleotide uh, phosphorylase. And, and together, they devised method for the synthesis of triplets catalyzed by polynucleotide phosphorylase, as shown here. Um, and here we're adding nucleotides to the three prime end of doublets. And then Leon Heppel suggested uh, a bizarre method uh, for the synthesis of triplets, which was a single sentence in one of the papers that he published. He found that rib pancreatic ribonuclease A would um, catalyze the synthesis of cytidine uh, or uridine, two prime, three prime cyclic phosphate, which would, in the presence of 30% methanol, would be added to the five prime end of doublets. So we used both of these methods to synthesize triplets and higher homologs, which we could then purify uh, uh, together. And so between the Corana lab and our lab, we um, identified the nucleotide uh, uh, sequences of the, the RNA codons. Now, we, f we found you know, very uh, almost immediately that, um, um, that, that the third prime, the, the, rather the third base position in, in a triplet uh, varied in a very systematic way. Um, uh, Marker and uh, um, uh, uh, also found that, that N-formula methionine tRNA would, uh, was the initiator codon um, uh, in E. coli, and uh, Sidney Brenner and Al Garin uh, and their colleagues found that, that the, the uh, nucleotides, the triplets shown in, in red, were terminator uh, codons. There's, the, the order of, of uh, amino acids in the code is not a random order, and that became very apparent. For example, the uh, amino acids with similar side chains, such as aspartic acid and glutamic acid, are coded by similar codons. Look at uh, asparagine and glutamine, for example. Most hydrophobic uh, amino acids have U as a central uh, uh, nucleotide, whereas hydrophilic amino acids have A as a uh, central codon. This, this um, problem has never been, been fully explained. I think that maybe early in the evolution of the code, the, um, um, that, that, that perhaps um, uh, the codon, the, the, um, uh, the, what was equivalent to, to a tRNA or, or the um, amino acid, side chain of amino acid, interacted directly with codon, anticodon, or the combination of, of the two. When we purified transfer RNA species, we found that some species of transfer RNA would recognize only G in the third position, others would recognize a single species of transfer RNA, U or C, still others, A or G. And Bob Holly gave us some of his yeast uh, alanine transfer RNA, which he had sequenced, determined it was the first um, biologically active nucleic acid that was sequenced. And we showed that it recognized GCU, GCC, and GCA. And the, the base that recognized the three alternative uh, bases in, in alanine codons was inosine. And many people have shown that trace bases in the anticodon or next to the anticodon are responsible for the, what, what Crick uh, called wobble. 
Now, after we had deciphered the genetic code of E. coli, we asked, is the code universal? And we determined the code in uh, Xenopus, in the amphibian, and the code in guinea pig liver, and found that they were essentially identical. And so the code has been conserved during evolution. But others have found since then that uh, some organisms have small changes in the code. There are dialects in the code. Also, mitochondria uh, have changes uh, in the code. Now, mitochondrial DNA only directs the synthesis of 10 to 13 proteins. So a change in the code in mitochondria that um, is, uh, will still be, uh, allow the, the mitochondria to be uh, functional, um, uh, it may be tolerated, whereas if that same change were, were to occur and be applied to the many thousands of proteins that the cell synthesizes, it might very well be lethal. So the code is um, a, a standard code, although there, there are some modifications in the code that have been found. Later, the 21st and 22nd amino acids uh, were, uh, were found. Uh, selenocysteine, which is coded by a terminator code on UGA if the messenger RNA has a stem loop structure in the three prime uh, uh, position, which is recognized by one or two proteins. And pyrolysine, which is found only in a few primitive bacteria and which is coded for by uh, the terminator code on UAG. And uh, my, the summary, the, these results suggest that the genetic code appeared very early during biological evolution, that all forms of life on Earth use the same or very similar genetic codes, that all forms of life on Earth descended from a common ancestor, and thus we're all related to one another. And by enabling the construction of progeny, the genetic code and DNA are used to solve the problem of biological time. Thank you very much, and my best wishes to Govind Karan.